So now on with risk management concepts. Quite a few things we're gonna talk about in this one. Threats and vulnerabilities, our risk assessment and analysis, the risk assignment and acceptance, countermeasures, the implementation of those countermeasures, the types of controls we're gonna have, our control assessment and monitoring and measurement, our asset valuation, reporting, continuous improvement, because we always want to move forward, and then finally wrap it up with some risk frameworks. So there are some risk management concepts that you need to know as a CISSP. They are heavy on uh, you knowing your vocabulary. You're going to be asked a series of questions paragraph form type questions that you need to be able to pick out keywords. Some of these keywords is what I want to talk about right now. Like risk, all right? Risk is a function of the likelihood. That's what we need to associate there. Uh, risk and the word likelihood. So it's the function of a likelihood of a given threat sources exercising a potential vulnerability. And then the resulting impact of that adverse event on the organization or on your company. So the risk is the likelihood of somebody doing something to cause you problems, to put it in layman's terms. A threat source, we're gonna talk about that here in a second, and a vulnerability is a weakness. So the threat source is the somebody, the vulnerability is the weakness that they're doing something to, to take advantage of you. Now, likelihood is probability. So the probability that a potential vulnerability or weakness may be exercised within the construct of the associated threat environment inside your organization, in other words. So the likelihood is the pro probability of a weakness being exploited inside of your company. A threat source, either intent, and method targeted at the intentional exploitation of a vulnerability, or it could be a situation or method that may accidentally trigger a vulnerability. So a threat source is what's doing the bad thing, regardless if it's intentional or not. Sometimes we have accidental things, <laughs> for lack of a technical term, go on inside of our organization. Somebody fat fingers something when they're typing in a password. So that could create an incident if they've forgotten their password now because they typed it in wrong. Um, that's accidental, right? What if somebody accidentally knocks something over on a computer and liquid gets down in there? Again, that's a threat source. The risk of something happening was the computer sitting on the floor by the water cooler. That's accidental. Could be a hacker has gotten into your system or there's a disgruntled employee and we have an insider threat. Those are all threat sources. Some of them intentional, some of them unintentional. So a threat is the potential for a threat source, that person, to exercise a specific vulnerability. And again, a vulnerability is a weakness. And we're gonna say that and talk about that here in just a second. But we keep talking about these and all these other concepts. So it's important that you know what a vulnerability is. So, what is a vulnerability? A flaw or a weakness in a system security procedures, the design, the implementation, or the internal controls. So, associate vulnerability and weakness is what we need to keyword associations there. Now, again, these vulnerabilities could be taken advantage of, right? Could be exercised accidentally or intentionally and result in a security breach. I haven't talked about that one yet, or a violation of our security policy. So the threat source takes advantage of our weaknesses, which is a vulnerability. Now we could have impact when that happens. That's the magnitude of harm that could, could, could be caused by a threat's exercise of a vulnerability. So the threat takes advantage of a weakness, your vulnerabilities, and that has an impact on your organization. Now, what are they going after though? You know, we have a threat source coming in. They're going after your assets more than likely. Anything of value that's owned by the organization. And we've talked about assets. We talked about that being the physical equipment, our computers, 
servers, laptops, firewalls, switches. We also talked about assets being data or personnel. So assets include both tangible items like information systems, data centers, servers, laptops, physical property, your filing cabinets, office equipment, um, your chairs, things like that, and intangible objects or assets like intellectual property, your data, what you've come up with and stuff like that. Now we could put in place a safeguard so we know there is a risk, the likelihood of something happening because we looked at our vulnerabilities, the weaknesses that we have in our organization and in our risk assessment we're going to look and see what the vulnerabilities are and what threats could take advantage of those vulnerabilities, what the risk is, because we need to know the impact of the threats that are taking advantage of that vulnerability because they are going after our assets. So we need to put safeguards in place to hopefully countermeasure this to, to stop them from coming in. So a safeguard is anything that removes or reduces a vulnerability or protects against one or more of a specific threat that we've identified. Now, this could be installing a software patch, making a configuration change on a, on a router or a firewall or a system, hiring security guards so they can protect the physical perimeter, altering the infrastructure, kind of goes along with configuration changes, but we could alter the infrastructure a little bit, maybe change vendors, have some diversity in there, modifying the processes of how things are done inside the organization internally, improving our security policy. Something has happened, we know there is a weakness here, so we can go back and tweak our security policy now. Training personnel to be more effective or train them more effectively could be a safeguard. So now they know what to look for. They know how to recognize social engineering or phishing attempts or tailgating. We could electrify a perimeter fence. That's a safeguard, right? They definitely keep me off of that from climbing that fence. We can install lights, right? All of these things are examples of safeguards, things that we're putting in place to reduce our vulnerabilities. Could be any action or product that reduces risk through the elimination or lessening of a threat or vulnerability anywhere within an organization. So it is important to remember that a safeguard or security control, right? We haven't, I've mentioned control a couple times, but a control is a safeguard, something we put in place to minimize those threats. Now, it doesn't always involve the purchase of a new product. All right, it doesn't mean, well, we have these threats, we have these vulnerabilities, let's go get the latest and greatest uh, network device, like a firewall, and stick it in place there to stop everything. It doesn't always need to be like that. We could reconfigure existing elements, existing infrastructure inside of our organization or remove elements from the infrastructure uh, that may be causing vulnerabilities in the first place. Maybe we have old equipment. Maybe we have older servers. Maybe we have older software running on those servers and the vendor is no longer uh, supplying updates or patches to that particular uh, application or software that you have for your organization. You may have to get rid of it completely. It may be an older operating system that's no longer supported. So we're gonna to have to upgrade or make changes to the existing elements, the existing infrastructure that we have. Those are all examples of safeguards, countermeasures, or controls that we can put in place. Now, what about an attack? Is an attack and a breach the same thing? Kind of, but kind of not. An attack is the exploitation of a vulnerability by a threat. In other words, an attack is an intentional attempt to exploit a vulnerability of an organization's security infrastructure to cause damage, loss, or disclosure of assets. Disclosure of assets meaning the data that we may have. An attack can also be viewed as any violation or failure to adhere to the organization's security policy. We have policies in place. If they don't adhere to it, it could be considered 
an attack. So an attack is somebody or something, the threat is taking advantage of a vulnerability, that weakness that we have. But what about a breach? Well, a breach is the occurrence of a security mechanism being bypassed or thwarted by a threat agent. When a breach is combined with an attack, a penetration or intrusion can result. So, an attack can take place and somebody could attack our network or attack our system, but they may not get anything, right? They may not obtain any of those assets like the data. A breach, however, is an attack where they've gotten in, penetrated controls that we have in place already, and maybe access some of that data. So a penetration is the condition in which a threat agent has gained access to the or organization's infrastructure through the circumvision of security controls and able to directly imperil assets, meaning they can get to the data. So if they can get in as an attack, if they can attack our system and they can get to the system, but then penetrate the system to get to the underlying data, our assets, then that's the problem that we really should have, uh, or we're really going to have, is now we have a breach or a security breach, which is the taking of information. We're attacked daily, all right? You, you may be under attack, your network may be under attack all the time. Um, as a consultant, I, I see this quite a bit. Uh, there's attacks throughout networks. That doesn't mean there's a breach necessarily, but somebody may be doing, say, a port scan or a ping sweep. That is a type of an attack, right? They're looking to see what's out there. They're looking for vulnerabilities because if they find a vulnerability, they may have an exploit for that vulnerability so they can take advantage of that. And who's this they I'm talking about? Those are the threats, right? So the threats are looking to see what's out there and they may attack you. If they are successful in penetrating in, that's a breach. Some other concepts that we need to be familiar with is MTBF, mean time between failures. So something may happen. We may have a failure. But what is mean time between failures? Well, that's the measure of the anticipated incident of failure for a system or component. This defines reliability for us. So, Another one we need to be familiar with, mean time to failure, MTTF. Now this is the average time to failure for non-repairable systems. And then we have mean time to restore, MTTR. This is the measurement of how long it takes to repair a system or component once the failure occurs. So usually you'll see that one in like an SLA. It says, well, if we go down, the MTTR is 10 minutes, saying, well, we're going to be down. We, we say we're going to take 10 minutes to get the component failures back online. Recovery time objectives, RTO, the maximum downtime considered acceptable for a process or service. So you may ask in an uh, S SLA, what is the RTO? You know, what is your RTO? I'm the service provider. You're my customer. What is your RTO? The maximum downtime considered acceptable. Say, well, you cannot be down for more than an hour. Okay, so that it means hour is my drop deadline, right? If I go over an hour, something catastrophic may happen to your business, which in turn may be catastrophic to our business relationship. Recovery point objective, RPO defines the point to which a crashed or failed system needs to be restored. So it crashed, what is the recovery point objective? When do we go back before the crash to get that data, right? So that's talking about when we do our backups, when do we go back in time, if you will, to our data to find our recovery point objective. Now we've mentioned threat sources quite a bit, or I've mentioned them, I guess. Um, and we said those are the things that are doing the bad stuff. Uh, and it could be unintentional as well. I can't say it's all bad, but we need to define what some of these threat sources are. We can have human threat sources, 
We hear about these all the time, the data breaches. This could be a malicious insider or a malicious outsider. Could be a terrorist, a spy, political or competitive operative. Loss of key personnel, errors made by human intervention. Again, that's unintentional. Could be cultural issues as well. So we could have lots of different human threat sources or lots of types of human threat sources, I should say, right? So that is a human doing the something, taking advantage of our vulnerability. We could have natural threat sources. We hear about these all the time as well. Floods, fires, tornadoes, hurricanes, snowstorms, earthquakes, all of the above. I think we probably had every one of these in the last month here, somewhere in the United States. Technical threat sources, hardware failures, software failures, malicious code, unauthorized use using the emerging services like wireless and new technologies that may not have been tested within our infrastructure, they introduce vulnerabilities as well. So they could be a technical threat because you can take advantage of those vulnerabilities. We could use wireless. If you don't have your wireless secured down enough, I could use your wireless as a threat source to attack your network. Physical threat sources, closed circuit TV failure due to faulty components, old wires, uh, older components throughout the system, perimeter defense failures. We could have environmental threat sources, hazarded waste, biological agents, utility failures, operational threat sources, a process that affects confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So some different threat sources in there. You may be, have already been familiar with the human threat sources, natural occurrences, uh, technical occurrences, physical, environmental, but those are some that we need to keep in the back of our head there. Now about the risk management process. Risk management is the process of identifying risks first. We have to know what's out there that poses the greatest threat or risks to us. We're going to assess the potential impacts to the organization. So if something was to take advantage of the risk that we have, so this is a high risk, we have vulnerabilities here, lots of them. What if somebody was to take advantage of those vulnerabilities? What impact to the organization are we going to sustain now? Determining the likelihood of the occurrence. Well, how often is that going to happen? I mean, really, we know, you know, we live in the Midwest, we could have tornadoes. How likely is that going to occur? We need to be able to communicate the findings to management and other affected parties like stakeholders, not shareholders, but stakeholders, anybody that has an interest in the business or organization. We have to be able to talk to them. Uh, I've mentioned this a couple of times in some other sections already in this domain. We have to be able to talk their talk. Don't put it way up here on a technical level. Get it down here on the level that they understand. Risk management is also the process of developing and implementing risk mitigation strategies. We want to reduce the risks to levels that are acceptable to the organization. We know there's going to be risks. There's risks in everything that we do in everyday life. But how we deal with those risks is part of the risk management process. We know, yep, we have a risk. Uh, we have 50 data centers throughout the globe. We're going to be attacked. We're going to be port scanned. We're going to be uh, scanned for live hosts. Maybe enumeration to take place as well may be hacked, but what's the likelihood of that, right? We have to think about that. What mitigation strategies can we put in place to lessen that attack or lessen the data breach or keep the data breach away? Maybe use firewalls, IDSs, IPSs. We can put things in place to lessen the risk. We always know it's gonna be there though. So the risk assessment and analysis. Let's talk about the quantitative method. Quantitative, uh, you need to think quantity. And when you think quantity, maybe you, I do, uh, maybe you should, think numbers, right? I can assign a number to this. So the quantitative method results in 
concrete probability percentages. So that means the end result is a report that has dollar figures for levels of risk, the potential loss, loss of countermeasures, and the value of the safeguards. So figures for levels of risk. This is how much this risk is going to cost us. The potential loss may be $10,000. The cost of a countermeasure may be $8,000, and the, the value of that may be more or less. Now, this report is usually fairly easy to understand because uh, it, it, it looks like a budget report. It, it's usually on some type of spreadsheet or I don't want to say accounting software, but it deals with numbers, right? This is a quantitative method. So we're dealing with numbers. We're dealing with dollar values. So I've seen them a lot on just regular spreadsheets where you can have columns of information and you add it up and you have a total at the bottom and you know if this happens, this is how much money it's going to cost. Now, quantitative analysis is the act, and this is the important part. This is the act of assigning a quantity to risk. We're placing a dollar figure on each asset and on each threat. Now, we can't do purely quantitative analysis. And we're going to talk about that in, the, in a couple slides coming up. Because not all elements of the aspects of analysis can be quantified. Some are qualitative, subjective, or intangible. So things we can't necessarily put a dollar figure on. Like the value of human life, for example. How much is that worth? That's intangible, right? Still an asset. Still something that we have to put into our risk analysis because we know personnel are our number one asset. So what about the data? Can we put a dollar figure on data? And say, well, that data on that hard drive is worth something. That may be a qualitative as well. We're gonna talk about that one. First, let's talk about the exposure factor because there are some formulas that we need to know. Now the exposure factor is the EF, and this represents the percentage of loss that an organization would experience if a specific asset were violated by a realized risk or a particular risk. So the exposure factor is the percentage of loss. How often, I guess, is what could happen. Now the EF can also be called loss potential. That's where I say could happen because it, you, it is the potential of this taking place. Now, most cases though, a realized risk does not result in a total loss of an asset. Uh, it may just be part of the asset. It may only be down for so long, for example. You know, it's not, you, 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 you're under a DOS attack, denial of service attack. You may be down for an hour. The exposure factor would be an hour. It's not down indefinitely unless they really had a good attack but you may be down for just a little bit. So the EF indicates the expected overall asset value loss because of a single realized risk or something has happened for a specific amount of time. That's the exposure factor. How long or is this exposed? Now the EF is usually a small number for assets that are easy, easily replaceable, like hardware, right? We've talked about data and we talked about personnel. Personnel irreplaceable. I mean, you can hire somebody else, but the loss of life is irreplaceable. If I lose a data center, I can buy more hardware. Not a problem, right? I need a budget for it. But as far as putting a new server in there, it's not that hard. Now, the EF can be very large for assets that are irreplaceable or proprietary, like product designs or databases of customers. Because we can't really say, well... Product design could be qualitative, but it, you know, it cost us $10 million to develop this product design over the last three years uh, in man hours and resources and time and effort and everything that we add together. Now, keep in mind that EF, exposure factor, is represented as a percentage. Now, something else we need to know about is called the SLE, single loss expectancy. And that's how much we expect to lose per time per loss. So the EF is needed to calculate the SLE. The exposure factor is needed to get our single loss expectancy. 
Again, SLE is the cost associated with a single realized risk against a specific asset, something that's worth something. Now, this indicates the exact amount of loss an organization would experience if that particular asset were harmed by a specific threat, taking advantage of, say, a vulnerability, that one of those weaknesses that we talked about. So the SLE is calculated using this formula right here, AV times EF, or asset value times the exposure factor, again, which is a percentage. Now we also have something called the annualized rate of occurrence, the ARO. This is the expected frequency with um, a specific threat or risk will occur within a single year. The word annual, annualized, should give that away. So an ARO is how many times it's gonna happen in a given year. Now it can have a range of zero, that no risk, no threat, there's, everything's cool, to a very large number indicating that the threat or risk could occur pretty often. So it can be zero, like, oh, it never happens. That's awesome. You don't think that's gonna happen, but that's awesome. Or it could be 12, once a month, 24, twice a month, six, every other month. Now, calculating the ARO can be a little complicated. It can be derived from historical records, statistical analysis, or just plain out guesswork. You know, think about it. Um, think about those natural threats that we talked about. You know, and then think about meteorologists. You know, they do a pretty good job, but they're not perfect. They don't get it right every time because they're looking at statistical analysis. Sometimes it's plain old guesswork. There's a warm front coming in. We have this and this. The conditions are good for tornadic activity. You know, they, they talk in probabilities all the time. 60% chance of rain, 40% chance, 43 well, to me, between 40 and 43, when it's talking about rain, it's not much of a difference. But in other things, it could be a big difference. So again, it's statistics, the analysis of those statistics and just plain guesswork or the historical records. ARO calculation is also known as probability determination. So if you're looking at probabilities, you may think of annualized rate of occurrence. Now, Another one you need to remember, another acronym, ALE, Annualized Lost Expectancy. So again, annualized, meaning we're talking about the whole year. So to get our ALE, we need to see what our SLE is, right? The single loss expectancy. It happens once, that's what we're going to lose. So we take the SLE and we multiply it times the ARO, the Annualized Rate of Occurrence and we get our annualized lost expectancy. So ALE equals SLE times ARO. So if the single loss is $1,000 and the annual loss, uh, annual rate of occurrence, excuse me, is four, 1,000 times four equals 4,000. So our annual loss expectancy for that particular risk is $4,000. And that's gonna be important because we want to minimize risk, right? We talked about that. We wanna to try to lessen the risk as much as possible. Well, if we know we're gonna lose $4,000, what can we put in place to help lessen that? Is there a way we can bring that in and say, well, the annual rate of occurrence now is only two. So our annual loss expectancy now is $2,000 and we're saving $2,000. But at the same time, how much did that control cost? Because if it costs more than what we're gonna save, it's not a good investment. So those are things that we have to keep in mind. That's why we need to know the exposure factor and percentages to get our single loss expectancy. Take that single loss expectancy, multiply that times however many times it's gonna happen a year. The annualized rate of occurrence, the ARO, and that's how we're gonna get our ALE annualized lost expectancy. Now those were all quantitative analysis. Well, earlier we said we can't just do quantitative analysis. We have to do qualitative too. Thinking about quality, I guess, if you will. 
So a qualitative risk analysis is more scenario-based than calculator-based, right? We can't really assign a number, say this is gonna happen this many times, and say, okay, this is how much money it's gonna cost us a year. So rather than assigning exact dollar figures to possible losses, you rank the threats. You know, you put them on a scale and you rank them and think about the risks, the costs, and the effects. And for each organization, it's gonna be different because what you see as uh, a high risk, I may not. And what you see as uh, a, a high asset or a, 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 a critical asset, I may not. So this could change, but for the most part, you're going to rank them. Instead of saying, well, that's worth 1,000, that's worth 2,000, that's worth 10,000, that's quantitative. I'm assigning dollar values. This is qualitative. I say, well, that's pretty important. That's not as important, that's very important. So we can rank those. Now, since purely quantitative risk assessment's not possible, like we said, it's not advisable anyway, balancing the results of quantitative analysis is going to be essential using qualitative analysis. So when we take quantitative and we put it with a qualitative analysis until the final assessment of an organization, that's known as a hybrid assessment or hybrid analysis because we're mixing two different ones together. Think of our hybrid cars, battery powered, gas powered. Best of both worlds, they say, right? Qualitative, quantitative. Best of both worlds, we're bringing them together to get this hybrid analysis. Now, the process of performing a good qualitative risk analysis involves good judgment, intuition, and most of all, in my opinion, is experience. If you've been with the corporation for a long time or the organization, you're gonna have the experience. You're gonna have that intuition of you know because you're thinking about um, trends, statistical analysis, guesswork perhaps, of what could happen, what may happen, what you think that's worth. Intuition means a lot when it comes to businesses, especially when you have uh, a good healthy experience of dealing with that organization or that particular business process.